we're very lucky to be brought, um, joined today by Mr. Paul Green. And Paul's a good friend of Picker, and um, he's a real PI. He's been doing it for a long time. He'll probably too long. He'll tell you. But um, look, it's it's good to pick the brains of somebody in there doing the work. And Paul's done a whole range of work, work which he'll tell you about from workplace stuff to insurance to all sorts of things. So um, Paul, look, thanks so much for joining us today. It's really important for our students to be able to talk to real people, not that Paul and I aren't of course, but um, you know, people doing different things out there. And look, this is our opportunity guys to, to bring you all these different experts um, and your opportunity to ask some questions, you know? So Paul, thanks for joining us. Just, can you just tell us a little bit about how you got into the industry? So I started in the New South Wales Police Force and did a couple of years there before I was actually offered a job uh, to leave and go into. Initially, it was all accident investigation and the basic fraud general insurance type areas. And then from there, it just grew. And, and as time went on, you moved into different parts of the investigations fields and got more experience. Yeah. So I've been a licensed, I'm talking about how long I've been in the industry. I've been a licensed investigator since 1990. Yeah. If that helps you, if you can do maths. <laughs> um, and what sort of work are you doing now? What's your day to day look like now? So move more into workplace investigations. I still do do work cover common law claims. And I also still do some CTP. I'm a big believer that you've got to stay spread across the field because you will, as time goes on in the industry, you'll experience um, highs and lows in different areas. So I've always believed in spreading a little bit of your work around. And same thing with working for different groups and different people and different clients. Yeah, interesting. Can you tell us a little bit more about that the C CTP and the common law claims, because that seems to be an area, uh, quite a big area of yeah. investigation where a lot of people may find themselves starting out and whether they want to or not, but yep. um, yeah. Yeah, I think from the starting out point, it's always going to be your general insurance lines, your CTP and your workers' compensation fields. So your CTP, obviously everyone knows CTP insurance and the investigation basically goes along the lines of you'll interview the insured driver, any witnesses, Sometimes I'll ask you to prepare uh, sketches of the scene. You will do, we were talking before about going and knocking on people's door. Nine times out of 10, they'll want to see canvas done. So you'll go and knock on all the doors or businesses around the area where it happened and try and locate witnesses. And then your workers' comp is similar again, but it's you will go to the employer and you'll take a statement from the employer or their representative, depending on how big the company is, any witnesses that were there or anyone who can talk about the system of work. It's a slightly different type of investigation where you may well be interviewing people who don't actually have any direct knowledge of the incident, but they can talk about how that job is done. Um, and then obviously there's still video photographs. Video and photograph is a big part of just about every investigation we do until you move into the workplace investigations. It's about the only place they're not required everywhere else. You'll be doing video and photographs or I do anyway. Mm. And look, probably one of the burning questions most people seem to have is, look, I'm doing this um, set three, I want to get licensed as an investigator. Will I find work? Will I find work? One, I guess we can talk about how they find it and the best way to do that. I, I believe there's still plenty of work out there. Um, and in a recent podcast that Greg and I discussed what's actually happening in the industry at the moment. And I said, I think if you went along and did uh, a review of all the guys who've got licenses and are currently working, you probably find we're all over 50. So any person, any young person coming into the industry at the moment, I think has got a great opportunity to get skilled, get involved. And that can only really be done, I believe, by getting in and working with some of the principal contractors. I think it would be very rare for anyone, unless you've got the right connections to go straight in and get your own clients. So you've got to be willing to go in and spend the time and, and work, unfortunately, for the lower dollars and get in with the principal contractor. They will get you on their panels, which gets you your experience, which then allows you to grow from there. But I believe there's plenty of work out there at the moment. Like I've not had a shortage of work for probably five years, yeah. you know? And even then it was a case of I'd gone out and specialized in a particular area. So then when that work dried up, we had to then go back and move into the other forms of investigation that we can do. So that's why since then I've maintained my workload across those number of different streams so that there's no shortage of work anymore. When one seems to get a little bit quieter, the other one sort of props it up and keeps it going. Mm. So yeah, no, that's, and, and that, that is my advice to anyone wanting to get into the industry is you've got to do that little bit of hard time for the lower dollar or find someone that you can go out with and get some experience. It'll help you get in. Um, and I don't think it's easy 
by any means to get in with some of the the bigger clients, your insurance companies, your solicitors, etc. You've got to go in and you've got to show them that you're willing to learn. You've got to show them that you can do a good quality of work. And then same with the principal contractors, they want to see someone's willing to come in and learn and spend the time and provide quality work so that they don't have to deal with issues out of it. Mm. Yeah, that's good advice. So, you know, you've just finished your cert three, let's take you back. Um, knowing what you know now, what, you know, what are these students that are doing this, wondering, you know, where and how, practically how are they, what would you do? And, and let's talk about some of the bigger companies that they could probably approach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so here in Queensland, of course, you've got Verifact, Morris J. Kerrigan Associates, Procorp, Quantum Corp, those sorts of bigger companies. There have been quite a lot of ads in the paper over the last mm, six to yeah, eight I've months, that. and that's a place to start. But also don't be afraid to put your resume together, show them what you've done, maybe even a couple of samples of your work and send it through to find out, you know, your investigators. So find out who the operations manager is for their investigations department and, and send an email through. Um, and I think you'll always find them receptive to finding a new person or another person. Uh, even though if you're in the middle of Brisbane, it's quite obviously a condensed area. There's a lot of investigators in there, but you'll still find that they're looking to put someone on the books that they can rely on to be able to send a job to. And that's probably the other piece of advice is there's a lot of investigators out there who won't be flexible. Like if the charge out point is here and they need a job done in a certain place, I've always been very flexible with all of the principles and, and even my clients that I have directly, because the idea is that you might take that job on this time because Joe wouldn't take it on and you'll get the next one that comes through there as well. If you do a good job, you know, they, once they see value in using you and, and to get the start, you just have to provide value, which means some of my clients that I, that I work directly with, I started at a lower rate than I get from principal contractors. But the idea was to get in, show them that I can provide them with quality work. And then as time's gone on, we've discussed the hourly rate, they've realised the value for dollar is there. So you know, it's now increased to more than that. Yeah. So that'd be my starting point though, is I'd start with the principal contractors, get an email out there, reply to ads, just show them that you're keen. Mm -hmm. um, you might have to follow up a couple of times with them because I will give you the heads up that they're probably not running around looking for someone all the time. Mm. Um, so follow up, don't be afraid to follow up and don't be a pest, but don't don't be afraid to follow up and show them that you're interested and keen. Mm. Um, I, look, I think the other thing is, and we've sort of touched on it, is that, you know, you don't need to have been an ex-cop to be a good investigator. And you've worked with probably hundreds of them over the years and you've been in the PI business far longer than you were in the cops. Mm, yeah. Um, it, that's true, isn't it? I honestly believe that it's not always ex-coppers that make the best investigators. Unfortunately, sometimes... One of the things, particularly no offense to those guys who've been in the police force for a long time, but you tend to develop habits and you structure your investigations around being a police officer mm -hmm. and the power that you actually have. And you've got to remember in our investigations, the actual power that you have to demand people give you a statement is very low. So you've got to develop that skill and you've got to develop the techniques that allow you to gather information from people. And I've got to be honest, some of the best investigators that I still work with and keep in touch with are guys who came through sales and marketing fields where they learned, particularly telesales, where they learned to keep people on the phone. They learned to ask questions and keep people interested in responding. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's not to say there's plenty of good ex-coppers out there who are, who are doing great investigation work as well, but it's not a reliant um, way of looking at it as far as I'm concerned. Like the, and you'll, you'll quite often find now a lot of the principal contractors are looking for non-police because mm, yeah. they've got plenty of ex-police in the background. Yeah. So they're looking for non-police that can bring a different set of skills and experience into the industry. Yeah. And just talking on that skill, I mean, what, for you, what's the most important skills that, you know, our people, the people doing these courses need to have? Our communication is by far and away the most important skill an investigator needs. And that communication is with the person you're trying to get the information from. It's with your client or your principal contractor. It's, it's the key to everything and learning how to communicate with different styles of different people. So you can, as an investigator, depending on what field you're in at the time, you can be sitting in the boardroom of a guy who's running a millions of dollars worth of business. And then the next day you can be interviewing a guy in a prison that's been there for five years and he was involved in an incident before he went there. So different skills, different communication styles and learning how to adapt between them, I think is the crucial part of being able to conduct a good investigation. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Paul, you got anything you want to ask? No, I, um, I 
not at the moment, but I, I did like the the thought about contacting the um, bigger firms, um, PI firms in your area, because I know for the New South Wales guys, they will have to do that because for the first year, you've got to come under a master license. So for all, all the students that are on and listening, um, yeah, in New South Wales, definitely you need to um, get your resume together and get in contact with those bigger firms so they can be um, your master. Just on that, I mean, how, how open are PIs to students or those that are not licensed or maybe newly licensed tagging along? I've done a lot of training for the principal companies. Mm -hmm. So probably because of my experience, I quite often get asked to take on someone who hasn't got experience and they'll, some of them will come out with me for two or three days. And I've had others come out with me for two or three weeks, mm -hmm. just depending on what their experience is, where they're coming from and where they're headed. Um, now I started in New South Wales where Paul's right, I had to do a sub license for the first 12 months under a master. Yeah. So I was lucky enough, obviously when I got offered the job that came with, okay, I'll, I'll look after you for the first 12 months. Um, but I would still say the same thing here in Queensland, whether you're working with someone, so you still got to go out with someone and learn the skills. And there's different formats and you'll learn it as you get, get in the first few jobs. There's all the formats are pretty similar but each different organisation. And then if you're working for one of the principals, you could end up working for five to 10 different insurance mm, companies mm. and they all have their own templates. And it's a matter of just learning how to read the template, respond to the template. Most importantly, read the instructions. When you get a file, you get a set of instructions. That's the paramount. If you don't respond to those instructions, when you provide your final report, that's when you'll get bad feedback. Mm. Mm. Okay. All right, look, um, I've got a thousand questions. You want to open them up to our students? Yeah, um, guys, um, do you, has anyone got any burning questions they want to ask Paul at this point in time? I've got a question for Paul. This is Carla here. Okay. Um, so I'm interested, Paul, you were talking a lot about going out and doing interviews and I guess going to sites and different things. I'm interested in the kind of, um, you know, intelligence gathering you do before that. So what sort of tools and techniques do you use on, to do online research? changed a lot over the years, Carla. Initially in the old days, we would get a file and before we had things like Google Maps or Google at all, you would just have to turn up and you had very little intelligence at all. These days, depending on what the file is, obviously if it's a workplace, I, I, I research the employer uh, and go through and just look at who they are. And you get things like ABN numbers and those sorts of things that you're going to require before you even go out there. In relation to CTP files, and particularly in relation to general insurance files, when you're doing fraud, I actually do a fair bit of research on the person I'm going to interview. And it may be a witness, or it may be actually the subject of the file, but we're lucky enough these days to be able to look at it. And because you want to know if you're heading out there and that person's got a bit of a criminal background, you want to know before you head out there that you're going into a situation where you just might need to be a little bit cautious. And obviously- And how are you finding that a criminal background? Well, that's you can if generally in a Google search, you'll find that it'll come up. If someone's been involved in something serious, it hits the papers. So, and what I say to people these days is when you Google something, don't stop at page one because that's what most people do. They'll Google someone's name, they'll look through page one. Oh, there's not much there. You go through now. Obviously, there's a lot of issues there as to you've got to confirm that it's the right person, but that's also the next step is whether or not you want to move into different softwares. If you want to full on get into intelligence within the industry, then you can move into some of the other softwares that are available, which will give you more information. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised at what information is out there available for free though, if you're willing Absolutely. to have a bit of a look. Google Maps is the other one where, you know, if you want to have a look at the house, look at the property, it's just a thing that I do probably from the little bit of time I had in the police force, but I always look at the property I'm going to on Google Maps and make sure where I park my car is where I'm going to be able to get a good quick exit. So always, if obviously if you're in a cul-de-sac, you don't point your car facing into the cul-de-sac, you point it facing out. Those sorts of just little things. Having said that, it's not a great concern in the industry. I think two or three times in 30 years, I've had issues where I've actually got up and left interviews because I thought the person was going sort of down a path where I didn't think we needed to go. So it's not a big issue, but it's always something to keep in the back of your mind. Yeah, good. Thanks, Paul. Anyone else got any questions? Surely. How much money am I going to make? That's the next one. Will I be buying my Ferrari and growing a moustache? <laughs> I always like to remind people that just like a plumber, carpenter, a consultant, you're coming in and you'll be working on an hourly and a kilometre rate. 
And that's one of the biggest issues I find is people come in and they think that they're just going to get a file and they're going to turn it around, they're going to make a lot of money. Now, the issue becomes is how many hours do you want to work? And we talk, we haven't really talked about it today, but in our podcast, we talked about the flexibility of the industry. And that's one of the reasons why I've stayed in the industry. I very rarely miss anything that my kids are doing in the school, in the schoolyard because of the flexibility. That's one of the biggest issues here. Um, but you need to realize that if you're going to take two hours off in the middle of the day to go to your kids' school play, you've then got to make that up at some stage. Otherwise, it's two hours that you don't bill out that day. Mm. So my biggest thing is the, the money's there to be made. It's up to you as to how many hours you want to put into it, how long you want to work for. Mm. That's, that's what will determine in the end how much money you make. There is very good money to be made in the industry. Once you cut your teeth, get some experience, there's very good money to be made. You can make a very comfortable life for yourself, but you've got to be willing to put in the hours just like any other person with a trade qualification or anything does. Mm. And on the flip side of that too, what are the downfalls of this industry and being a Self, uh, you know, uh, self-employed investigator. The downfalls are, I believe, the biggest downfall is setting yourself up to be financially stable through the peaks and troughs. Because even in a period where you've got a lot of work on, you'll find that you may not turn around work for a week, two weeks. So, and I'm actually, I can tell you right now, I'm coming off a period where I didn't finish a job for nearly two and a half weeks. So, therefore, the way that if you're working with the principal contractors or your own clients, depending on the terms you've got with them, there's a period there where you're not going to get paid for a period of weeks. So what I've done over the years is just build up a, a balance level. And that's where I like to keep that balance level. And so long as I've got that there, just like any other business, it's all on profit and loss on your balance sheet. So as long as you've got that there, you're right. And you keep topping that up and you keep that at a certain place. Um, when you Obviously, when you're first starting out, you don't have that. So, but the idea too is you should only have a few jobs at a time on, so you should be able to turn them around relatively quickly. You know, there is talk in the industry at the moment about um, bringing in systems whereby you'll be able to put incremental bills in. And I'll tell you, like, I've got two jobs on at the moment that I've been working on for 12 months, and I've gone back to the clients. At the first one was at three months and just said, look, happy to keep working on this for you, but obviously we can't, being self-employed, you can't carry the debt for the period of time it looks like it's going to take to, to do the job. So they've allowed incremental billing. And again, it's that communication. They know you provide good quality work. They know that you're going to follow through and finish the job off no matter how long it takes. So they've allowed incremental billing in those circumstances. So don't be afraid to also go back and talk to your client or to the principal contractor about that type of thing. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. That's... Um, I've speaking with a mate of mine who's a, an accountant and runs his own business days he said the standard most people work off is to have three months of wages in your bank account yeah if, if you can get if everyone could get themselves to that sort of level and that's what you sort of operate on that you've got um three months there he said that's a good way to operate that's exactly what i have paul so that's a right good on figure yeah um what would a uh, question I, I'm going to ask for the students um, is if you're starting out as an investigator, what would be the hourly rate that you would hope to um, bill? Be, uh, we're not talking fully experienced person here. We, we've got to understand that when you're starting out, what, what do the students, what should they sort of be expecting? I would be thinking if you're going to one of the principal contractors, now I can talk here in Queensland, I know New South Wales is slightly different, but here in Queensland, I would be expecting that they'd be happy to give you 30 to $35 an hour as a minimum start. Right. And I know it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but I think that's where you'd have to be willing to start. You may get more. And you've also got to remember, once you get your first few jobs and if you can do a good quality job, you should be able to jump through that rankings pretty quickly and get yourself up to where everybody else probably not you know there's there's probably a small number of us who get paid a little bit more than others because of our experience and because we work across a lot of fields yeah but when you're coming in particularly with a principal contractor they're going to stick you into general insurance and ct fee to start off with so um, one of the things that you've got to remember is that those fields don't pay as highly as say workplace mm -hmm. investigations yeah so I think that is a realistic starting figure. Um, if they're offering you less than that, could be trying to take advantage of you just to try and get someone in and get some experience. But you've got to remember, they've got to get you out with an experienced investigator. 
So you're not making any money for them. Unfortunately, it's the way this industry works is that you're a bit of a liability until you get enough experience to go out and do your own job. Yeah. And if the guys I've trained over the years, I've always said to them, so they'll come out and do some jobs with me and then they keep in touch with me. So, and it might be over the next month, it might be over the next six to 12 months, they'll send me a statement that they took or they'll ring me and say, listen, I'm in the middle of something and I don't quite know how to handle this. And I'm quite happy to do that with people that you're training. Like I said, it's, I think it's great to get particularly people from different backgrounds into the industry. Mm -hmm. and I think you'll find most investigators that the principal contractors will put you with will be the same, have the same theory. Um, okay, so we're looking at say $30 an hour kicking off. Yeah. After about a year's experience, I'm, yeah. I'm just sort of trying asking these questions for people, students um, looking at working out a budget for starting a business and that. So what would be sort of a standard, I'm not, just a very standard rate that they would expect after their initial year, say, of $30 an hour, what would it move to? You should be looking at moving to $40, $45 an hour after 12 months with full experience. Right. And then from there, the increments get smaller. Right, yeah, yeah. So you know, going up from there. And you know, there's always been this thing in the industry about what we should and shouldn't earn. And, and over the years, there's been a lot of discussion. The principal contractors keep their rates very close to their chest. We, you know, even to this day, I still do not know how much the insurance companies pay them. Everyone's got their ideas as to what it is. Yeah. Um, but again, your value to them is how good the quality of your work is. If you can provide a quality of work that they have to do very little on once it hits the office, then when you go in to negotiate with them, you've got a much stronger case. Yeah. And a kilometre rate, is there a sort of a standard? I think, look, mate, it hasn't changed in 10 years, been 65 to 75 cents per kilometre. Right. Um, the, the issue becomes there, obviously, is where your charge outs are, that type of thing. I've found all the principal contractors that I've worked for, as we were saying before, I was saying I'm quite flexible about where I go. So I'm based on the Sunshine Coast. For those of you who know where that is in Queensland, I do a lot of work on the south side of Brisbane, particularly in a couple of different lines of business. And all of the principal contractors pay me from Chermside, which means I'm giving up 30 minutes and about 45 kilometres of charging, but the work is well worth it. Yeah. There's plenty of work down there. And the other thing you'll learn is once you've been in the industry for a little while and you've got a few jobs on the go, you'll have jobs from different clients that you can go to the same area and do. And that's where you can pick up a little bit of what I call the cream. So, you know, it, it's, it's not the done thing to double bill for everything. If you're going to the same area, you do have to cost share a little bit, but you can pick up a little bit of cream just to make it extra and make it worthwhile. Yeah. No, that's great. Cool. Wayne, I think Wayne's got a question. Yeah. Hey guys, just back on the master license um, section. If I was to work for like a big insurance firm, Allianz, NRMA, anyone like that, do I still need to have a, a private investigator's license as well? It's, Wayne, here in Queensland, it's a different system. The, as, as I understand it, the insurance companies can engage a private investigator, not a private investigator, the insurance companies can engage an investigator and they don't necessarily need a private investigator's license. Although you'll find most of the guys do. I've got a couple of mates who work internally and they've all got licenses because they all come from a sub subcontract background. But I do know that there are some former claims staff that are in the investigator positions with them. Um, and I think what happens, you'll find, is the insurance companies encourage them to then go and get their certificate. But I'm not sure that they are required to have it because of the way their legislation works. Okay, yep, yeah. yeah. As I'm just thinking, like, um, once I finish the course, if I can't go under, like, if I can't operate under our master license without that other license, if I was to pick up work with, say, NRMA or something like that, even though I've got Cert 3, I'm just thinking, would I still have to go and apply for the, you know, investigator's license or the private investigator's license? Yeah. Uh, what state are we talking, Wayne? New South Wales. I have a feeling in New South Wales, you will have to have your license. But, yep. but once again, just double check. I'm, I'm not the all knowing on that. Please, please double check with licensing on that. I guess the other thing to say is that the reality is you won't get direct yeah. work through those companies, Wayne. Um, they've got panels. You want to just yeah. talk a bit about that? So panel, 
depending on the, who is managing investigations within each of the insurance companies at the time, each of the managers seems to have a different idea as to how valuable uh, insurance investigation panels are. So the panel, what happens is every 12 months, every 24 months, each insurance company opens up their panel for tender. And then all of the principal contractors all go and apply. Now at the moment, all of the insurance companies have got a blanket rule that they will only deal with national businesses. So someone like me, I can't apply to be on the panel of someone like Allianz, RACQ, NRMA, because they're not interested in dealing with one man bands anymore. Um, when I first started in this industry, it was quite the opposite. They were very interested in dealing with one man bands and you could get on the panel of all sorts of different insurance companies as a single operator. These days they want national companies. So then normally they take on three, four, five companies and they become the principal contractors and then they subcontract the work out to the rest of us. So that's that middleman operation that they've got going. And the whole reason they like that is they want one point of contact. So they'll, if you're with Kerrigan's, Verifact, Procorp, they just want to contact someone there and say, listen, I just got a job from you. There's a problem with it or I've got a new job. Can you guys take it on? They don't want to be going around all different guys saying, oh, can you take this one on? Can you take this one on? That's the reason behind it. Uh, work cover is different here in Queensland now. They've, they've abolished the panel. So they've actually left it up to the solicitors that are managing the common law claims to organise their own uh, investigators. And that's where there is an opportunity. And that's where a lot of my clients, Lalo, I've got a lot of um, solicitors that I've worked with over the years who, when the panels got abolished, they came to me and said, well, you work directly for us. So that's a different thing here in Queensland, but it's different in each state. And that's what I suppose you need to get your head around is how you're going to run your business and what your model is going to be in each state. Cool. In New South Wales, Wayne, um, I've only got a couple of mates who are still in the industry down there. Most of them, most of them have moved on now and retired. Um, but there is the opportunity to get work with directly with the insurance companies. But I think you'll find you would have to wait until you've got your full license. I'd be surprised if any of them would take on someone who hasn't got a full license. Yeah. Okay. If that doesn't stop you from applying, mate, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, the skills in, and, and it comes back to the interview like I have um, going back 20 years I actually applied for a couple of internal positions up here in Queensland when I, when I first came I moved in 2001 I moved from New South Wales here to Queensland and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to stay as a subcontractor or go internal and I applied for a couple of jobs at the time and went for interviews and got offered one position and, and turned it down purely because I'd then built the relationship with a principal contractor and we went really well um, so it's it's not in the interview, it's all about how you portray yourself and the quality of work that you're going to be able to provide to them and the willingness in particular to, to put the effort into giving them a good quality of work. I think that's the most important thing. Your experience is obviously important, but if you can show them that you're going to give them value for dollar, like any job application, then you'll get a start. Um, is there much work with solicitors for criminal law investigations? Interesting. So criminal Defence work is becoming more popular. So do it is, and I've got to be honest with you, Ellie, it's not an area that I do a lot of work in, particularly these days. Ten years ago, I did do some work for solicitors in that area, and I believe, talking to other guys in the industry, that it's a bit of a growth area at the moment, but it's not an area that I've gotten much involved in. I've sort of stuck to initially the other side of the business and then more recently the workplace investigations. So I can't give you any concrete evidence, but from what I'm hearing. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, you can get online on Facebook. There's a couple of forums that you can apply to come in on. And uh, the guys on there are really good. Like even I go on there after 30 years, I still go on and ask a question here and there about something I'm looking at, or, you know, particularly when you're looking at moving into different fields, there's guys on there with lots of experience who are quite happy to talk to you about it. Mm. That's good. Thank you, I appreciate that, <laughs> thanks. Well, criminal defence, um, yeah, it's a, it's a niche area and you would have to have some a fair bit of experience. I, I would suggest for a, a solicitor to take you on, probably ex-cop, I'd say, only because they know what the cops do. So they've sort of got a bit of an advantage. But look, in, in the weeks or months to come, we'll be talking to another PI who's based in London now and he's a fascinating story about getting a fellow in Singapore off death row. Um, and it was in, in the papers about a month ago, and um, it's a fascinating story. So, that, you know, there is that, that's the highest level defence, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Good for that guy. He's not dead. And there's opportunity there. Like I say, mm -hmm. that's, that's where I think one of the key things that coming into this industry at this time now, you need to be open to different lines that mm -hmm. those of us have been here a long time 
haven't even worked in. And I think there'll be newer lines than that even coming with all the cyber work, et cetera, that's going on now. Um, I think over the next five to 10 years, the industry is going to go through a substantial change again. Uh, and whilst CTP and general insurance and work cover will still always be a really good stable base, there'll be new lines coming in that you can supplement your income with. I do know of a guy who does nothing but that criminal defence work uh, here, in, here in Queensland. And his background is policing and that's how he got into it. So obviously he had a relationship with lawyers and when he got out of the police force, he moved into it and he does nothing but work for solicitors in that field. Um, and again, Elliot's just like we were talking about with how to get a start with the principal contractors, put your resume together. If you're studying at that, that type of level, you'll probably get the attention of the lawyers when you start sending your resume through. Pick, pick the firms that you really want to work for. Um, it might be a bit hard for you to find out who's good and who's not good to work for because there's not going to be a great deal of people who actually specialise in that, that field in the industry. But my theory has always been I'll take on a job from anybody and start working for them. And with the, well, the time you've done three, four, five jobs, you know whether or not you want to develop that relationship. And if you're finding them difficult to work for for some reason or they're not good at paying, all those types of issues, that's when you can start to weed out as you get more clients. Pick a sister company, of course, Forensics, um, which Paul and I are also um, directors of, where uh, we're moving into this um, legal area as well. And part of that will involve some, you know, advertising ourselves as being available for criminal defence. It's not an area traditionally I have wanted to go into. Um, being an ex-policeman, I typically don't want to um, help defendants. But look, the, the thing is, it's about the justice system and everyone. And look, there are people that are wronged up. And as I said, in, in months to come, we'll be talking to a fellow that um, got someone off death row in, in Singapore who had plant, who they alleged some, you know, had some drugs planted on him. So it is an interesting area. Unfortunately, all those of us who come from a policing background, even with the small bit that I've got, you tend to get a little bit jaded. And it's a, it's a warning to everybody out there who's doing their Cert 3, is that when you're interviewing someone, you never ever presume that they're guilty or innocent. And I can honestly tell you after 30 years of doing this, I've given up trying to tell whether someone's telling me the truth or not. You know, when you start out, I often used to, oh yeah, I think he's telling me the truth. Now that doesn't weigh in, of course, because it's all about the evidence and what you can put in your report at the end. But it's an interesting way to look at it. and. And it's a very conscious thing that you have to have when you're doing an investigation is to make sure that you don't fall into the trap of feeling sorry for someone because they've got a great sob story. Or likewise, I've met this employer and he's a great bloke, so he can't be doing the wrong thing by these employees. It's all about what the evidence says. And that's the only thing that matters in the end. All of those other things can be great investigative tools because they can lead you to other parts. Like, you know, particularly things like, obviously we all know hearsay is not admissible in court, but hearsay is a great place to start and then dig deeper to actually get the evidence that supports what you're looking for. So a lot of people, they'll as soon as they hear, I oh, know it's hearsay, I don't want to hear it. I always say to people, I want to hear everything that you want to tell me because I may not be able to put that in that statement we're putting together here, but I certainly may be able to go and dig a little bit deeper and find that evidence somewhere else. Exactly. I, I agree with that, Paul. I came from a background as an intelligence analyst. Oh, and yeah. so, um, you know, my job was to find intelligence and I still think it is. Um, and then you, from intelligence, you go and look for where, where is going to be, be the evidence. Exactly right. And I think that is a growing part of the industry, Carla. I think intelligence, even in, in general insurance, CTP and work cover that I keep talking about, I think intelligence is going to be a growing area there. For those of you who don't know, on just about every work cover and CTP file that we do now, we're required to do searches across social media platforms because surveillance is a wonderful tool, but probably our most successful tool in having people charged with fraud these days is social media. God love it. <laughs> in the workplace investigations color is that the employers want us to not only come into the workplace and resolve issues, but yep. they will want you to prepare social media reports and things so that they can make a decision because yep. you're wrong. They might necessarily be not necessarily looking to charge someone with something, but they just want to sort out this workplace issue and get it resolved, get it back to being a good, happy and productive workplace. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, nearly running out of time, guys. Um, any more questions for Paul? Um, Paul, I just have a question. We were, um, it's Lily here. 
just before the call started, we were having a bit of a chat um, about skip tracing, and I'm very interested in that field. Um, my background's marketing, and just naturally, that's I find that very interesting. Um, but what would your advice be, if any, um, in terms of if you're wanting to go down that path or kind of dig a little bit deeper, I guess, even into personnel vetting for things like government agencies, people who need to hold quiet high security clearances and doing a bit of that field work, um, would your advice be still to start in the workplace or CTP insurance side or are there other pathways as well if that's more of a field you want to go down? This is the growth field, Lily, and okay. won't surprise you that at 53 years of age, I'm currently studying online intelligence Yeah, <laughs> um, because I can see that that's where we're going. Yeah, uh, it's and it's going to like I said, it's going to be part of every investigation. But if you're not interested in getting into general CTP work cover and that sort of thing, you'll find the principal contractors will actually be looking to employ people to do their intelligence, to do their skip tracing. I know a lot of the solicitors use different firms to do their skip tracing for them, um, and it's a that's what I'm going to look to offer. Again, I'm still even though I'm I'm looking at another 10, 12 years in the industry. I'm still looking to grow and change with the industry and offer to my clients everything under the one roof. So rather than have my client go out and get their skip tracing done with someone else, I want them to come and get their skip tracing done with me as well as give me the instructions to do the investigation. So that's why I'm currently studying to get some online intelligence qualifications. Not through picker, I might add, but stay tuned on that. <laughs> um, we, I think, Paul, you've talked about our short course, which is a general introduction, but yeah. we're working very hard on a proper OSINT, yeah. so open source intelligence course, because there, oh, awesome. there isn't any yeah. accredited um, skip tracing courses around in this country. It's not something, but uh, we're working pretty hard to get this, our pretty comprehensive OSINT course up. So, yeah. um, And that's, I, I do honestly believe that it's going to become a bigger issue yeah. in the future. And good examples of where it became really important to be able to do online intelligence were whenever we have a financial crash in the mining industry or the gas industry here in Queensland, you have workers disappear. So overnight, everything falls apart. And we were chasing guys and doing online statements from guys in Western Australia, because obviously that's where the gas and the mining work was. So and that's where online intelligence is becoming really important is being able to track people down. Because the day in the old days, you would just go and do an electoral roll search, go and knock on their new mm. door, that sort of thing. That now, we're such a transient society that people are moving states, moving countries. I've actually taken statements from people via Facebook in New Zealand and other countries overseas now because they've left the country. Any other questions for Paul? What? Oh, wait there, I do have one more. Yeah. Just, <laughs> um, Paul, I don't know if you saw last night and it was just interesting talking about um, your background, whether it's fraud and things like that. The case, and I don't know if you've seen it, but that was on 60 Minutes last night with Melissa Caddick. Yeah. Um, do you have any just brief thoughts around someone vanishing with a lot of a lot of money and not being found yet? And just how the likelihood of someone being found and what how many private investigators would be biting at the chomp to kind of solve that? I think I didn't catch all of that. I did flick through that a couple of times, I've got to be honest. It's not once those cases sort of hit that level of um, notoriety on, on television, I'm not really that interested in getting involved in it. But I have, I've done quite a bit of work over the years locating people for people. Mm -hmm. Now, the first caveat there is be very careful who you're working for because there's plenty of people out there who are looking for people for the wrong reasons. Um, so make sure you, you're doing the job for the right person in the right circumstances is the only advice I give you there. Um, and to get a big case like that, if you're trying to make a name for yourself in an industry, then that'd be great. Um, the chances of finding her purely depends on what steps she's taken to hide herself. Now, if the police get involved, obviously they have powers that no one in the online intelligence community outside of the police force can act on. So once the police get involved, she's had to have gone to great lengths to hide herself. So not to say that it's not possible. There's plenty of examples of people out there who've disappeared off the face of the earth and never returned. Yeah, yeah. It's possible to do it, but in the current age of technology, 
it's a very difficult thing to do. You've really got to get offline. And that, in, that increases, uh, that includes your different profiles and things. And I tell people quite often, when you're first doing your searches and that, and you can't find a person on social media or on Google or somewhere like that, you just need to dig deeper and you need to find out more about who they are. Because quite often you'll find, you can't find Joe Blogs on Facebook or Instagram, but you'll find Jenny Blogs or you'll find wife, kids, cousin, someone. And then it's a matter of working out how to then determine that's the person you're looking for. And that's where some of the old fashioned techniques mm, come in. That's right. Yeah, it's all, it's all good to do this open source intelligence and yeah. sit in front of a computer. Ultimately, the end, you've got to get off your bum and sometimes knock on doors and um, speak be, with people. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be verified. And look, Makes there's sense, yeah. plenty of people out there who are happy to do the online stuff. You mm. still need someone occasionally, well, more often than not, you'll need someone to go and verify. Mm. That's where the person lives. That is definitely the person. People, I think we'd better wrap, wrap it up. Um, Paul, um, thank you so much for your time. No problem, mate. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I look forward to getting some more younger people and people from different backgrounds into the industry. Um, Greg, did you want to? No, no, I just wanted to thank Paul. You know, he's yeah. taking time out of his day. He's busy mm. um, to, to come in and talk. So I hope everyone appreciates it. Uh, we might get him back on later on in the year because it's yeah, sure. really informative. So yeah. hope we have a few more people. Um, in to listen it's just so good to hear from and people. if anybody finds me in one of the forums don't be afraid mm. to shoot me or send these guys a question yeah more than happy to help out yeah sweet appreciate that paul